Hello, health champions. Today, I want to help you understand the biggest lie about blood sugar. And there are several components to this that when we believe this and we don't understand how blood sugar works, then we can get hurt. So when we're told that energy comes from blood sugar, what does that mean? Is that all energy? Is it some of the energy? And this misunderstanding is so common that in our culture, we talk about it all the time that your blood sugar must be low. You're not feeling good. Your blood sugar must be low. Go ahead and eat something to get your blood sugar back up. Now, here's the problem. When we buy into this belief system that energy comes from blood sugar and you have to eat to regulate your blood sugar, then blood sugar, which is supposed to be maintained in a very narrow band for optimal function. So now, we go eat something and blood sugar goes up. But high blood sugar is not a good thing. So the body needs to regulate that and bring it back down. And now we release insulin and our blood sugar comes back down. But now we feel bad. We have a lack of energy. We have brain fog. We don't feel good. So now we're told eat something. You must have low blood sugar. So we eat something, blood sugar goes up. Now we feel good, insulin brings it down. Now we feel bad. So we end up on this roller coaster. If we think that we need to eat to quickly top off that blood sugar to function, then we end up with this roller coaster. And instead, what the body is looking for is stability. So when we eat something, if we eat whole food with some fat and some protein, not a bunch of sugar, not a bunch of processed foods, your blood sugar is not supposed to go up very much at all just because you eat something. So it might rise a few points, but it doesn't really leave this narrow healthy band. And then afterward, it doesn't crash. So we don't get these mood swings and these ups and downs, but the body instead can maintain these blood sugar levels for level energy and level mood. Now, blood sugar is important, but blood sugar is not the only source of energy, not even for the brain. We're often told that the brain can only run on glucose. That's not true. When we're really low on glucose, when there's not a lot available, the body switches. It has a backup system called ketones. And as much as 75% of energy for the brain can come from ketones. But the key to understand is that it's about stability. And when we eat real food and we don't eat all the time, the body knows how to regulate this. When we eat to top off blood sugar, when we think that a lack of food is the reason we feel the way we do, now we create these blood sugar roller coasters. So if you do a little reading on what we think is normal as a society. The traditional view is that a normal fasting blood sugar should be between 70 and 100. But then if you're impaired, meaning that you're pre-diabetic, now that would be between 101 to 125. And if it goes above 125, it's called type 2 diabetes. And so far, that's not all that crazy. I sort of buy into this for the most part. However, then they say that 30 minutes after a meal, it's normal to have a blood sugar of 170 to 200. No, that's not normal. This is what they consider normal. That's what we've been trained to think by topping off our blood sugar. And 30 minutes after a meal, if you're impaired, if you're pre-diabetic, then they say it's okay for it to be 190 to 230. And if you're diabetic, then 220 to 300 would be expected. But then it gets even crazier because they say that two to three hours after a meal, it's okay, it's normal for it to still be 120 to 140, to still have elevated blood sugar several hours after a meal. And if you're impaired, it could be 140 to 160. And if you're diabetic, it could be over 200 several hours after a meal. And it's good that they understand that a pre-diabetic or diabetic 
that these numbers are too high several hours after. But what's crazy is that they think it's normal for it to be elevated that far after. So here's how it's supposed to work. An optimal level, first of all, is lower. It's 80 to 90. Or if you're fasting a little bit longer or if you're in a low-carb diet, then it can even be totally okay to be less than 80. But fasting should really not be over 90. And then when you eat real food, when you eat something solid, like putting a log on the fire that burns slowly for a long time, then you can still be in this range even after eating. So 90 to 110 is optimal. And if you don't eat a bunch of processed food and sugar, then it's not going to go into these crazy numbers. And then two to three hours, you should be back at your fasting level. It should not be a major drama for the body, a major challenge to get it back in. You should eat something, it rises a few points, and then it goes right back to balance. And another way of looking at this is, here is the normal with the numbers, and then if you're impaired, it's a little bit higher and it takes a little bit longer. If you're diabetic, then it's a little bit higher to start with and it's much worse in bringing it down afterwards. But again, the optimal is relatively to the, to the other lines. It's almost a flat line. So if we look at the first 30 minutes after we eat, then they're suggesting that this would be normal, whereas this is really how the body should behave. And I know we're told all the time about energy being calories. For, to get a certain energy, you need so many calories. But the food doesn't really have calories. It's only to the extent that we can convert it into ATP. That is the only form of energy that the body uses. So it's really pretty simple. If you think about this as the A, as the adenosine, and then we have different phosphates. We have one, two, or three phosphates. And then we have like a little spring, and we load that spring up with the first phosphate. And now it's called AMP, adenosine monophosphate. So there's a tiny little bit of energy in that spring. And then we load up a second spring with the second phosphate, and now it's called ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And then we load up a third one. And of course, now this third one is called ATP for adenosine triphosphate. So that's a high energy state. So the vast majority of energy production comes from us loading up this spring and then we pop off that third phosphate and then the body, after you use the energy, the body goes right back into putting another phosphate on there to make that high energy state. So we go back and forth between ADP and ATP and that's how the body makes energy and how the body uses energy. So the body can use two different pathways to make this ATP and one is called oxidative phosphorylation and the other one is called glycolysis. Now, oxidative simply means that it is aerobic, it's with oxygen. There is enough oxygen present to fully complete this process. And the other one is called glycolysis and that's the one that doesn't have oxygen. It's anaerobic and we don't have enough oxygen present to drive it. Now, the key to understand is that when we have oxygen present, then it's much more efficient. And in one round of what's called the citric acid cycle, we can make over 30 ATPs. Whereas when we don't have oxygen present, when we just have to cleave a glucose molecule, break a glucose ring, then we get two ATPs. And the other thing to understand is that the body can use either fat or glucose to oxidize the fuel. So it doesn't matter. It's equally efficient when there is oxygen present. However, when there is not, then we can only use glucose. We can only cleave that glucose ring and get these two ATPs. And fat doesn't work 
in that scenario. But this is what's supposed to happen normally. That's what's supposed to happen 99% of the time. When we're at rest, when we're at moderate levels of activity, then this cycle runs completely. And when we have an emergency, when we're running up a hill, when we're running from a tiger, now this is the emergency fuel kicks in, but it's very, very inefficient. And we have to use a lot of glucose for a very short period of time to generate enough energy. So if, for example, a hundred meter runner in just getting out of the blocks, when they're using maximum energy, the highest power output a human can generate, we have about three seconds worth of ATP. And then the body kicks in and it starts making energy with oxygen through this oxidative phosphorylation. But in the 100 meter sprint, we can't keep up. So we're breaking down a lot of glucose into lactic acid and that's where we get the muscle burn and we start huffing and puffing and breathing really, really hard. But this is supposed to be the exception and only run for a very short time. And the most a human can store of glycogen is about 1400 calories, whereas with fat, it's almost unlimited. Virtually everyone has at least 100,000 calories stored as fat, but a really obese person could have up to a million calories stored. So another way of looking at that is glycogen can last you about one day and fat can last you for months. And why does the body store it mostly as fat? Because it's so much more effective to store it as fat. So carbohydrates have four calories per gram and fat has nine calories per gram. But that's not even a fair comparison because carbohydrates, the glycogen also is like a sponge. It binds a lot of water, it pulls water to it. So in reality, Glycogen, because it, every gram of glycogen holds about three, four grams of water, then 75% of glycogen is really water. So we're only getting about one calorie per gram when we store glycogen. And with fat, there is a tiny little bit of water in fat tissue, but we're really getting about eight calories per gram out of that body tissue. And the reason the body stores energy mostly as fat is that it's the only practical, the only reasonable way to do it. So if you take the average person of about 150 pounds and 25% body fat, they're gonna have about 135,000 calories stored as fat. That's 17 kilograms or 37 and a half pounds of fat. And if you were to store that same amount of energy in the body as glycogen, then you would have to store 136 kilograms or about 300 pounds worth of glycogen by the time it pulls that water to it. So obviously you can't have 150 pounds of other tissue of muscles and bone and then store another 300 pounds of energy. It just doesn't work. Now here's what we need to understand about this. It's that fat is eight times more effective as a storage form for energy. And therefore the innate balance in the body is that more than 99% of our energy stores are in the form of fat. But it doesn't mean that you have to eat only fat because excess carbs are also stored as fat and excess fat is also stored as fat. But what's important is to understand that this graph I grew with the blood sugar swings, that blood sugar swings make us store excess carbs, but then we get hungry again. Whereas when we eat fat and protein and fiber, then we get full for a longer time and we are much less likely to overeat. So excess carbs is no problem. It's very, very easy to eat excess carbs. Excess fat is not very easy to do. And if fat is the form that we store energy, then that is also our preferred fuel. 
it would be insane for the body to store 99% of its energy as fat and then for the body to prefer carbohydrate. It just doesn't work that way. That's totally backwards. And yes, blood sugar is very important, but it's not going to be our main source of energy. So stable blood sugar is what we're looking for. Stable blood glucose means stable energy. Unstable blood sugar that we get from topping off through the food, that is very unstable energy. And not only energy, but with that we also get unstable mood. And when we do this frequently and over and over, like we've done as a lifestyle in the modern world, we also get on the track for insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke, and also low-grade chronic inflammation that contributes to all this, as well as dementia. So don't buy into the lie that Blood sugar is so important that it's our only source, our primary source of fuel, and therefore we need to eat frequent meals to maintain it. And that leads us to eating high carbs, starches, and sugar, because if we get these blood sugar swings and we get on the low end of that roller coaster, then we're going to be craving these high carb, starchy, sugary foods to bring that blood sugar up as fast as possible. And now, of course, we get blood sugar swings, we get energy swings, we get carb dependence, because with this pattern, you train your body to have highs and lows. And every time that it's a low, then you depend on these carbs to bring it back up. And once you're in that situation, now you perpetuate the need for more frequent meals and for more high starchy sugary foods. So does that mean that carbs are evil? Well, there are many different types of carbs. Excess sugar, excess processed carbs, and starchy carbs are not so great. But then there's others in the form of non-starchy vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, etc. Then there are leafy greens, which is exactly what they sound like, and then there are carbs called fiber that we can't digest, but that can be important for other reasons. So if we're talking about metabolically, if we're talking about a person's metabolic health, about its carbohydrate tolerance, the body machine's ability to process through carbohydrates, then the top three, the sugar, processed carbs, and starchy carbs are indeed evil with sugar being by far the worst and starchy carbs not being so bad for some people, but also not necessary and not something you should eat massive amounts of. But the bottom three are pretty much okay for anybody from a metabolic standpoint, that you could have almost as much non-starchy veggies as you like, you could have as much leafy greens as you like, and you should eat a variety of food that gives you a large variety of fiber. But that's metabolically speaking. Now, instead, if we talk about tolerance, how well people do with these foods, that's a completely different story. And we have to put a big question mark there because there's thousands of different scenarios on why people would do well with these. So for example, the top ones here, some people might actually tolerate them pretty well, meaning they don't feel horrible because these are broken down very quickly and absorbed early in the digestive tract. Whereas the ones on the bottom here, they have a much slower processing. They have a lot of fiber that we can't digest. So very few of these in the bottom three are gonna be absorbed quickly and get into your bloodstream. So most of these will stay in your gut and start feeding the gut bacteria. So depending on the type of bacteria you have, you could do horribly and get gassy and get toxic and not feel very well at all. So we have to understand that there's not a one size fits all. So carbs are not evil per se, but the question then is, do we actually need carbs? So first of all, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. There's essential fatty acids, there's essential amino acids, but carbs, no. 
Next thing, the brain does need a little bit of glucose. It can rely on ketones, as we said, but it does need glucose. So if you're fasting, if there is no food available, which has been the case for a lot of human history, then we can live off body fat. And in that body fat, there is still about 5% glucose indirectly. So body fat, like we said, is in the form of triglycerides, meaning three fatty acids backed up to a glycerol backbone. And that glycerol can be turned into glucose. So the short answer is that no, we don't need carbohydrates. However, your gut bacteria do. So then the question is, do you actually need all that gut bacteria or could you just stay carnivore for the rest of your life? Or do you have these gut bacteria so you could eat and process the plant foods and the plant foods then feed this gut bacteria and the bacteria have additional properties, additional benefits. And this is what we don't know yet. I'm gonna be leaning toward the camp that says we do need a wide variety and we do need to eat a wide variety of plant foods. And the reason I would say that is that humans probably in our history over hundreds of thousands of years probably have eaten a wide variety of foods, including both meat and a wide variety of fiber. So I would say probably for optimal long-term health. So we also need to understand the difference between most and all. Because once we do research and something comes back and they say that this protocol was overwhelmingly significant, that this protocol helped eight out of 10 people get better. Well, that still means that two out of 10 people did not get better. They have some other type of problem. And on this channel, I talk a lot about metabolic health, about insulin resistance, about processed foods and sugar, because that is the problem for about eight out of 10 people. But it also means that it's not the problem for two out of 10 people. So I also try to put in other things to help you say the bigger picture, factors like stress and various deficiencies or toxicities. If you're deficient in nutrients or if you're toxic with heavy metals or chemicals or pesticides, if you have allergies, if you have chronic infections or immune issues, if you have autoimmune diseases, and also there's something called endotoxicity that you could basically be poisoning yourself from the inside by having dysbiosis, by having an imbalance in your bacteria. So certain bacteria, when they overgrow, they produce, for example, something called lipopolysaccharides or LPS, which is extremely toxic to you. But if you have an overgrowth and you keep feeding them, then you're gonna be poisoning yourself from the inside all the time. And the reason I said on the previous slide that I believe that a healthy, varied, strong microbiome probably is better for optimal health is that we start seeing so much of these different problems and most of those are probably gut related. And because there are so many variables, because we live in a very complex, very polluted world with lots of junk food and additives and antibiotics and imbalances, we need to measure if we truly want to know. And there's several different things we want to measure. We want to measure our metabolic spectrum. Where are we on the spectrum of insulin resistance and metabolic health? So people on the green side, meaning very insulin sensitive, can eat completely different foods than the people who are on the insulin resistant side of the spectrum. And the main things we want to measure here are directly involved with this is glucose, triglycerides, A1C, and insulin. And the first two are going to be on virtually every blood test they ever run. A1C is kind of hit or miss, and insulin you will never find on a standard blood test performed by a medical doctor. And that might be, or that is, 
the most important marker to help us understand our metabolic health. We need to understand cholesterol for many, many different reasons. It is an important factor. It is an indirect marker for inflammation and cardiovascular disease. But we need to measure the things that matter. We need to measure your LDL particle count, your LDL particle size, and the number of small LDL particles. Another good idea is to measure something about your autoimmunity because that is becoming so prevalent these days. You could measure your thyroid peroxidase, your TPO antibodies, and your thyroglobulin antibodies because they're going to be by far the most common. There are also tests for brain health, for cognitive function. You can measure your omega-6 to omega-3 ratios as well as your EPA and your DHA status. And that's going to tell you a lot about your brain health and your cognitive function. And last but not least, more and more people probably want to look into their gut health as well. And here we measure a microbiome DNA sequencing. So a complete sequencing of all the bacteria there. So not every person on the planet is going to need all of these different tests. If you just start eating real food and you get fantastically better, then great. But if you tried a lot of things and you're not getting better, then chances are that your answer is going to be in one of these categories or maybe several of them. So I'll put some resources down below if you want to check it out further. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.